I would love to invite you this morning to get going into 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, please. That is where we will be focusing on chapter 12, moving into chapter 15 today. So if you're there, you're in a great spot. A couple of quick thoughts leading into our short study today. We have really been working on pushing forward on a regular congregational Bible read, which if you've picked that up, if you've joined in on that, then you just finished reading the first Corinthian letter yesterday. Today starts 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And that's part of why we preached on what we did last week. We had just been in the text of reading the first half or so of the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter that Paul writes to, to Christians, and he writes very beautifully early on in chapter 1, very positively. He talks about their salvation, their sanctification. He talks about who, how Jesus brought them together, and it's really great. But we definitely noted very, very early on in that letter that that church had some problems. So I'm just going to recap very briefly some of what we saw last Last week in the first 10 chapters or so, that church is not unlike if we received a letter here, any of the Lord's local churches, there would be great commendation of who we are in Christ, a tremendous amount of hope, but definitely issues upon which we needed to put focus. So you might remember some of these. I'll just put them all out there for you. These were just a brief list, not even a complete list, just a brief list of some of the problems that was going on there. The biggest thing was there was just this segregation and division in chapter one. And unfortunately, there are some things they should have understood about Christ, but they were still on milk when they should have been sort of dining on the heavier matters. We moved through. They were tolerating immorality they shouldn't have. And unfortunately, they were like suing each other. There was some legal battles going on. Uh, they should have been more financially supportive of the spreading of the gospel and the work. They were sort of stingy in that way and then, and then kind of cliquish when it came to something sacred and amazing. Even like the Lord's Supper. They weren't even waiting on each other and they were kind of doing it in a segregated kind of way. And so as we went into that study, we noted that there still can be optimism in that church, but they need to find the solution to all these problems. But it's not a bunch of different solutions. It's one central solution and that's where we focused in on Jesus. We went back through, you might remember last week, and we saw that in every one of these passages, he brings up Jesus Christ, our Lord. He takes them back to who their identity is in Christ and what Christ has done for them and how he's brought them together and purified them. And if Jesus is more in the conversation, you're already speaking the answer to the problem. You just have to figure out what the connections are. And I really hope that if nothing came out of last week, a couple of things did. I hope that there's optimism, even in a local church such as ours, working through things in and out and up and down. But I also hope that in your own life, maybe you just said his name one or two more times last week than usual. Maybe you're facing some problem and instead of hitting it from the same angle or just striking out at someone else, you thought first to mention that maybe Jesus has something to say about that. And maybe who he is is a factor. And so we kind of finished with this transformational idea. If Christ is in the middle of everything, then watch what happens to all these problems. You go from division to a Christ-centered approach. You go from immaturity to maturing in Christ. And each one of these is related to Jesus. All of a sudden, I'm less cliquish because I'm waiting on fellow partakers of the goodness of Jesus. All of a sudden, working our way up from the bottom, I'm, I'm sacrificial in my giving and my time because that's what Jesus did for me. And that's what he purchased. So we did a lot of that last time. But we had to stop before we could get through to the end of the letter where he kind of says, hey, I'll tell you kind of how to do this. Because it's one thing to say, man, more Jesus and t-shirts and stuff. Like it's one thing to say much more Jesus and we'll figure this out. But it's another thing to actually practically know what in the world to do. So I want to share with you a few things. One of them in particular will get our focus. But if we had kept going in that sermon on Sunday and we'd have thought, okay, what are we going to do about this? One of the things you would have been challenged to do, and I'm doing this with you this morning, is you have to think individually before you can think collectively. In other words... The church doesn't get stronger and the church doesn't get more Christ-centered and Jesus doesn't become our solution unless you become more Christ-centered, unless he becomes more your solution, unless you kind of own your part in it. How does the Lindell Church get stronger? A few people hear the sermon this morning and those few people get stronger. And then their families start to get a little bit stronger and then their friend group and before you know it, the whole culture of a church has changed on an individual level. So there's some individual challenges. And here's what we would see if we finish the letter, and we won't talk about it in great depth today. But I have your Bible open to 1 Corinthians 12, and Tony Sellers mentioned this in his closing remarks last week about how we get Christ back in the middle. Well, part of it is you need to understand where you are in Christ's story. 
And in Christ's story, he is the head and we are the body. And in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, it has many members, but we're all a part of one body in Christ. We were baptized not into like some just a relationship with Jesus. We were baptized into a body, whether Jews or Greek. And so verse 25, verse 25, it's important that there are no divisions and that we care for one another. So we'll focus on this one today. I want to get to the third one for our study today. But if you're looking to get Christ back in the center of your thinking and your life and you want to see a church grow and get strengthened, then on an individual level, you need to understand that you weren't just baptized into a relationship with Jesus. You were baptized into a body of believers. You function as a piece of a whole and your piece affects that whole. And the way you care for your fellow brethren is your walk in the Lord. The second one's really easy. It comes in the next chapter. We know it really well. He says, we should talk about love, the love that the Lord has for you. And you'll note in chapter 13, verse one, he's not talking about collectively the Lindell church needs to grow in love. He's saying you individual, I need to grow in love. I need to understand that it doesn't matter what my gifts are or what I know or what I do. If I don't live in Christ's love, then I'm a part of the problem and not the solution. So those are really, really good. If you were thinking, man, I, I really would like to be a factor that helps. Well, those are two great things. But I'm going to tell you that chapter 15 is, is even better. What do I need to learn about Jesus in order for him to become more the center of everything that I do? I need to learn as much as I possibly can about his resurrection. Now, we could debate this later, but of the three things there, what is the most important? You might say, well, love is the most important, or, or the body is the most important, but what's the big deal? Why would it even matter if you were a part of the body of Christ if there was no resurrection? If you're going to live to be a certain age, and then you're going to stop breathing, and then it's all going to be over, who cares if we're at church or not? You go, well, it makes my life better. There's a lot of ways to make your life better. Being a part of the body of Christ is only important because Jesus was resurrected and brought new life. Love is kind of the same way. I know love endures forever. That's the point. But, but what's the point of sacrificial love if there's no resurrection? If it's not leading to an eternity, if we're not headed somewhere of great consequence, then, then love whoever you want, however you want, because there's no outcome that matters. But there is, and it is the resurrection. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 15 together, and I've got a few specific challenges for you today to ask you about the relevance of the resurrection of Jesus in your life and how that is affecting everything else that you do. And then we'll do a little bit of practical stuff. So let's go to a really cool slide of an empty tomb. And here's the thing. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. There are three different elements of the resurrection being discussed I want to share with you. The first is this. It's either this or this. Okay, either Christ has been raised or he has not been raised. And one of those is true and the other one isn't. And the ramifications of each are massive. Now, first of all, begin with me in the first several verses. Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by also which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. I'm like, what is that word? What is that word upon which we stand? What is that word upon which we are saved? What is that word that needs to be preached? He said, here it is. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And there's evidence because he appeared to Peter, then he appeared to the 12, then he appeared to 500, then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and he said he even appeared to me. Now, I don't know how this hits you, but the death, burial, and resurrection is the centerpiece of the gospel, and there's no gospel without it. It is the single most transformational truth that exists in the entire world. And this is the point I was making earlier. Let me go back really quick and show you this box. What did I do? I did stuff. I hit buttons and stuff. Never go back. Never go back. Being a part of the body and loving each other, that's a pretty big deal. But I'm just here to tell you, without the resurrection... It'll never be the deal that it ought to be, and it'll never change us like it ought to be. So let's get into the resurrection a little bit. Let me go back to this text. See these right here? I'm going to ask you something as we're reading, how much you believe in this. I want you to think in terms of grading yourself while I read this. I want you to place a smiley face up there. Okay, I'm going to give you some real smiley faces in a minute. 
But I want you to place a smiley face on this graph. Zero percent. Jesus was not raised. It's not true. All the way over to it is the single, central, real reality that drives my entire life. That's this side. Jesus was raised. Now, the ramifications of these two are massive. Stick with me in the text and let me begin in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead... How does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, what, Matt, what becomes true if Christ has not been raised? If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is vain. Your faith, one body, church service, doesn't matter. It's all vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testify against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. What falls apart if Christ has not been raised? Everything falls apart. And by extension, if you do not believe Christ has been raised, everything in your life will fall apart as well. That is the truth if you grade yourself somewhere over here. All of this becomes hollow. It becomes fake. It's a bunch of band-aids on a weird life. And it will not be the transformation that it ought to be. Now he says, but Christ has been raised. A couple of verses here, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Remember, he was an eyewitness of it. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end, he says, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority, and he goes on to say, the last enemy to be abolished is death. Now, if Christ has been raised, and you live under the belief that Christ has been raised, everything changes. Because he has raised, resurrection is possible, and it is real, and death is not this super scary monster that I have to do everything in my power to avoid. It's just a, a passageway from what is temporal to what is eternal. So that's the first part of this. Now, here's what I want you doing. I want you to put your smiley face up there somewhere. Or if it's over, I tell you what, if it's on that side, make it a frowny face. I have one frowny face to show you today. Here's what I want you to begin to see before we even get to the punchline today. To the extent that the resurrection of Christ is a central reality to your life, anything is possible with your faith. Any transformation is possible. And becoming the kind of piece of the body of Christ that God wants you to be is empowered by the resurrection. But to the extent that any of this is missing in your heart, it will begin to show in a lot of places. All right. Let me show you a second thing here. This text is not just about how confident am I zero to 100 that Christ has been raised. It's also about these two very important distinctions. Ultimately, the text was about resurrection in general. Is there even a resurrection? He was just using Christ as like this central evidence to say, you know, it's a big deal, that answer. And he is. So I'm going to have you do the exact same thing here. I wish this was a Bible class. I'd love to know what you think. But now I want you to decide, okay, okay, great. Here's what I believe about what Jesus did, how true it is that he did it, what he accomplished, whether or not the tomb was empty and what it means. Now, the second question is, but what about me, though? Now, me means you, not me. You focus on you for a minute. Am I going to be raised when I leave this life as an eternity coming? Or, or, or will I not be raised? Will it not happen for me? Now, for you, it's going to get more complicated than just, yes, I will be like Jesus or no, I won't. You also have to decide whether you're going to be raised to spiritual life or not. I think they're, they're kind of this weird category of churchgoer who are not sure how to answer this second category, because if you're like, if you're asking me how confident I am that there will be a resurrection and I'll be in it, I'm really high. If you're asking how confident I am I'm going to be on the saved side of it, well, you know what? You pick an average between those two numbers, and that's where you place your smiley face, okay? This text is about Christians being raised to life and being confident in it. Let me show this to you. Go with me to our text, please, and I'll begin here in verse 22. Again, he said, As in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. 
It'll be Christ first. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. So those who belong to Christ at his coming, raised to life. Then comes the end. He'll take all of those who've been raised in him and he'll hand them over to the Father and death will be abolished forever and for good. Do you believe that is going to happen to you? Zero to a hundred, how sure are you of that? How confident? How real is it? How much do you think about it? How heavily does it impact the decisions that you make? The things that you do? I want to know the factor because I think one of the other risks is you will create an emotional and intellectual separation. You go, well, intellectually, I believe in my Bible and it's 100%, but emotionally, like for real skis in your heart. How seriously real is this? You go, well, okay, that number's a little bit different. That's your number. Your number is an intellectual fact. Your number is the way you intimate intellectual fact. Verse 42, let me tell you more about it. You go, well, I don't know. Let me tell me a little more and I'll decide. Not a problem. So also verse 42 is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. Your physical body will, will die. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. Put in a box made into ashes and spread, it's weak. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, the one you brought with you this morning, but it will be raised a spiritual body, one that will be made for you later. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now you see that sentence? I just want you to see how much you're willing to own that sentence. Listen to it again. If there is a natural body, there is, there is also a spiritual body. How confident are you of that? He goes on to say in verse 45, he carries it on a little further about this. He says, the first man, Adam, became, uh, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last became a life-giving spirit. The spiritual is not first, the natural comes first. First your natural life, verse 46, then your spiritual life. And he talks about that heavenly image. Let's read a little bit more, verse 54. How's this going to work? Well, this perishable is going to put on the imperishable. And this mortal will put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Where's your victory, death? Where's your sting? And then, of course, it is healed and we are redeemed and death is powerless in the coming of Jesus Christ. All right, you got you some smiley faces up there? Chris, you got your smiley faces? All right. One more, though. This text is about transforming me by the truth of the resurrection, but there are three transformations. One is the first category, what I believe about what Jesus did. My belief in what happened. My second one is my confidence that I'm going to be a part of it. You see that? The first one is, I believe what happened. The second one is my confidence that I will be a part of that story. And the third one is my conviction of how I'm going to live in the meantime. You think those three are connected? That's kind of the point today. How connected those three are. Let me show this to you and then I'll put the things on the, on the chart. Go back to the text. I want to begin in verse 30 and read through 34. So what? What does all this belief have to do with things? Well, look at verse 30. Paul speaks of his own life. He says, you know, you guys who are doubting that Christ was raised and you're doubting that you're going to be raised and you're not doing so great on the first two charts here. He said, I got a question. Why are we in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I boast in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. There's a lot of rich stuff here, but let's start with this. Take your time. We got all day. You got three smiley faces up there, maybe a frowny face. I ask you about your confidence in the reality of the empty tomb, which is central to everything. It's of first importance. I ask you how confident you are that you're a piece of that story. You're a saved piece of that story and that there's no condemnation in you and that death will be deceived. It will be overcome in the end. And now I'm asking you, which of these binary extremes best defines your life? You see what he said? He said, verse 31, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, he is raised. He will raise me. I die daily. It's not perfection, but it is full involvement, incorporation and sacrifice. It's being a part of the one body. It's living with love and it's serving one another. I die daily. He said, look, if there's no resurrection of the dead, if there's not going to be, if this is not real, then forget die daily. What a fool I would be. 
What a fool I would be to sacrifice and give and put others first and be radical in my faith if there's no resurrection. And that's what the early part of the chapter says. It says, you're dummy. You're completely mistaken. I wonder how many of us, what do we call it? I'm not a gambler. But maybe we hedge our bets a little bit. I'm nearly pretty totally sure that those first two things are legit. But not so much that I'm going to get all crazy about it. That I'm going to go to the logical extreme and push it to it. So, so we move this back a little bit. And part of it's like a just in case. It doesn't work out that way. But that means that our first bar is not as high as we thought. He said, listen, bad company. How many of you guys know the Bible says evil company corrupts good morals? That's the first time you've ever heard that before. Boy, that's used in every application, in every situation, in every youth retreat, and it's very rarely used in the context of the reason it was written. You know what bad company is? Bad company is someone who has lost reality and touch and confidence in the empty tomb and the ruling Jesus. Bad company is someone who says, look, I mean, it's a story. It's probably true. Maybe it's true. Maybe you're in high school. Maybe it's true. But that, you know, even if it was true, like it's not going to happen to you. It doesn't make any sense. And so this idea that you're just going to be like crazy involved in things of faith is just foolishness. He said, that's the kind of people that are going to get in your way. So you need to become sober minded and stop sinning as some have no knowledge of God. So let's talk about this just a little bit. Now, I don't know what you put on here. I've got a punchline here where we're going with this, but I, I don't know what you put. But I thought that there would probably be, if we just kind of came in and set this up before we started, there would be quite a few people who'd be like, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that right there. Like, I've been in the church for most of my life. I know the Bible really, really well. I believe the tomb is empty 100%, and I, the, the trumpet's going to sound. And then they get to the third one, they'd be like, but, you know, Maybe if you want to get down to like my actual life. And look, none of this is perfection. I mean, we don't reach perfection. But, and, and you may be growing. New Christians are growing. But, but there would probably be people in the room who would go, this is how I've settled in. Like this is basically my life now. My life is 100%, 100% and better than average. Here's what I'm here to tell you. This chart does not exist. What do you mean it doesn't exist? If you are fully saturated in the reality of a Christ who defeated death, you would not be able to stop here. You're sitting out there going, well, that's kind of, though, that's kind of me, though. That is kind of me. Better than average, sacrifice more than your average guy, uh, sing the songs, do the Lord's Supper. So I'm like, I, I peg that out. I just need to work on this. The point I'm going to give you is you cannot move the third thing up unless you move the first two things up. Now you're looking at this chart going, that's impossible. That's why this chart doesn't exist. You talk about the scriptures where it goes, increase my faith or help my unbelief. Or this idea, verse 58 of our text, that because of the victory that's coming in Christ, because of that victory, I'm steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need to get back to these first two categories and decide I've got some growing to do. I think this is what frustrates Christians. They go, well, I've, I've pegged out the belief stuff. I pretty much fully believe but for some reason, my life is just not continuing to be renovated. You've deceived yourself. Because only by growing in faith can those things develop. Now, I thought about mine. I thought, what would mine look like? If I was gonna, this is me earlier this week when I first started studying. I, I mean, I, I, look, I'm sorry. That's, that's the way I think of myself. I think of myself as totally believe that, 100% believe that. Now, here's where I got a little weird in my own life is I had to back it down just a little bit when I got to the second one. And you might be like, that's strange. Why would anybody ever do that? I mean, if Jesus is raised, you're going to be raised. But there's a little bit of a difference. And looking back in history and going, man, the evidence is overwhelming. That happened. That tomb was empty. But now you're asking me to believe that I'm 40. I'll be 45 in a few days. And I'll have a few more li years to live. And then I'm going to stop breathing. And then I'm going to go on to this, this eternity. And there's this real transition for me and for you and for every person. And you're asking me to believe that I'm on the save side of it, which is... And so I start getting a little bit challenged and I back it down just a little bit. And then if I'm being honest, I'm going to frowny face. I did. I was, I was feeling very bad about myself. If you're asking me, like, do I die daily? I notice that these things are not connected. Now, go to Romans 4 for a moment. What I want you to see as we conclude this lesson is grace to faith to life. 
Every person in this room can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean figure out what to do. That means learn more about his life, death, and resurrection. Become more convinced, more intimately connected, believing it in great depth. In chapter 3, in Romans chapter 4, I should say, in verse 22, it talked about those who are credited as righteousness. And then in verse 23 of Romans 4, now for his own now, not for his own sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions was raised because of our justification. That's category one. I want to grow in my belief in that. I want to grow in my emotional connection to the fact that he was raised. Therefore, having been justified by faith, faith in what? Faith in his resurrection, faith in the reality of it. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. And then, then we face tribulations, verse 3. Then we persevere. Then we prove our character. Here's the thing. If you've pegged out everything you'll ever believe and know and feel about Jesus, and your character is not developing towards dying daily, you're going to live a very frustrated life trying to works-based your way to better faith. All along, you've miscalculated step one. If you are struggling to grow into a sacrificial, selfless, Christ-centered spirit, the first thing that you need to do is you need to understand your Lord better. And that needs to not insult you this morning. You go, I've been in church for 50 years. You're trying to tell me I need to understand the Lord better? Absolutely. We have to grow in those. Let me show you what it really looks like. Here's my idea of what it really, really looks like. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's say somebody shows up and they go, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been working on this and, and this is kind of where I am. I mean, I, I think I'm working on it, but there's just a lot more. There's, you know, there's just things that I'm overlooking. There's things that I can't stay focused on. I'm not doing so good. I would say you go, okay, if that's where you are, then here's my argument. All three of them are always aligned together. There's not one out of whack with the other because they're all three perfectly connected and one doesn't move without the other. And when one moves, the other moves. And as the top thing moves, the middle thing moves. And as the middle thing moves, the bottom thing moves. How much preaching do we do on this little guy right here? How much of our preaching is about that? Well, we need to be more of this and be less of that and be at church more and serve more and give more. And we're trying to like push this forward to dying daily. And all the while he's saying, you can't get there from down here. You get there from the top. Let me show it to you in this beautiful letter that was written to Christians, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. 1 Peter chapter 1, it starts with this top thing leading into the middle thing. He reminds them of this. He says, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You see that? Number one, raised him from the dead. Number two, he has created an imperishable future for you. You are protected, verse 5, by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. And he goes on to say, now that's going to get tested. Verse 7, that is going to get tested. And chapter 1 and verse 13, you're going to have to do some things. But what you can do will only be as strong as what you believe and how real that is to you. And that's why he starts the letter by talking about the great assurances in Christ. Now, I'm going to test this theory with an illustration, share with you a few practical things and we'll be finished. Let me give you an illustration. You might be out there going, I don't, I don't think so, Chris. I think you can kind of peg out your faith. You, kind of, you just get it. You just saturate yourself in it. And then you've got to work on this bottom thing, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of just bootstrap and prayer. I'm a time travel guy. My wife, this, my wife and I get along pretty well, except I watch time travel movies. She watches none. Okay, so I want you to imagine for a moment. Let's just test this theory. Let's just test it. I want you to imagine you had very limited access. I brought to your house a time machine. I don't know what it looks like. Kind of depends on you, how old you are. Maybe it's a DeLorean. I don't know. Maybe it's a phone booth. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's just like Christmas ghosts or something to be seasoned. But I show up at your house. I say, we're going to take two trips and we're going to come back. Okay, it's, it's after lunch. We leave here. We all go get some lunch. First thing we do is we hop in that time machine. We'll say it's a phone booth for today's example. And it takes you all the way back to the day that Jesus died and you watch it happen. You watch him die. And we stick around for three days and we kind of know where to go. So we like gather over in this spot. 
And on the third day, he is raised and you see him raised from the dead and you see the imprints that they put in his hands and you stick around and we hang out for about 40 days and you watch Jesus ascend into heaven. You literally saw him die and be raised and ascend. And then we time travel back to here. Here's my question. Is anything about your life going to change? Lengthy pause for dramatic effect. What changes? Anything change? You go, nothing changes. I think I'll probably just, I think tonight I'll probably just do the same thing I was going to do. Uh, tomorrow at work, I'll do the same thing I'm going to do. I think my life would change. I think if I saw it, I watched it happen, which would be pegging out that first thing, like boom, peg it out, that my bottom bar would begin to move because of the reality of it. To the extent that I'm admitting that to you, what am I admitting to you? My faith in him needs to grow. It needs to grow as if I saw it with my own eyes. And whatever changes I would have made if we time traveled back, I need to learn to make by faith even now. You go, okay, is that it? That was really impressive. Now I got one more. So we hop in that same time machine. This time we go forward to the day that Jesus returns. And you watch it happen. You hear the trumpet sound. You watch Jesus come. You see all the dead souls raised and you finally figure out what those new bodies are going to look like. And you see yourself and others being welcomed into the glories of heaven and you see the angels and the Lord. And it's real. It's not a maybe. It's not a, yeah, I'll be raised. It's a, I see myself raised. Now we come back and you've got two things in tow that you didn't have before. The 100% full reality of those first two things. My question is, does your life change? I think mission-wise evangelistically, I think we'd all change. That's my, you can fight me on that later if you want. I think many, many things would change. To the extent that something would change, something needs to change. But what needs to change will be based upon that which we are convicted on and understand. So what do we do? Well, let me finish with this. Thank you guys for your attention today. Let me just finish with these thoughts. Remember when we talked about the things that the church needed to change? I'm going to talk to you about those in a second, but let me just give you a list of things. You see these? We talk about these quite a bit. How much, look, just look at the list. I won't, I'm not going to do a verse for every list. We're practically done today. I just want you to read the list. I could give you three passages for everything on this list. How much of your heart and mind and life and devotion is given to reading scripture to know him better? Or do you already know him? You go, well, I already know him. But does your life reflect that you know him? We go, well, that's different. You know, you can fully know the Lord and not live a fully devoted life. Ex excuse me? How do I fully know the Lord and not fully give myself? I need to learn the Lord better so I can give myself more. So, how often are you praying for him to give you help and wisdom? to reveal who he is to you? How often do you think on Christ and his glory when conversationally you don't just speak of the, the carnal things, the physical things, but the spiritual and emotional things and you make his victory and his coming the single central importance of your whole life? Look at the list. Anybody who's going, I did all that. Now I just need to figure out how to be a better person. You're not going to become a better person. It is drawing more close to Jesus that allows him to transform you into a better person. He can do amazing things. Now, watch what happens. Spend some time. I got some slides in the back. I want you to take these home and look at them. Now we get back to all that stuff that was going on in the church. Now, watch this. Now, I'm just growing in this, and I'm making this so central. And now I get to here, and I realize, you know what? I, I can do this. I want you to look at the list on the right. I don't think there's a Christian here who says, you know, I, I don't need to strive for unity among the body a little bit more humbly. Or, or I don't need to learn more or, or pursue morality and holiness more. It's the opposite of all the problems. I just went and re-grabbed all the problems that the church had. And individually, that I don't need to be able to take the wrong more or give more liberally or wait on each other and stop making it about me. I want to grow in all those things, don't you? That's category three. That is this. We can do it. You can do it. And I can do it. But if you think those things are going to get better without time devoted to these, 
then we have lost our understanding about the power of cr the cross to transform us. You know why Paul died daily? Died daily? Because chapter 2, verse 2 says, I have come to know nothing except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Faith to life. How's your faith? To the pursuit of that goal of deepened faith, it will change your life. Can we help you? Can we encourage you? Are you leaning into Christ and you want to obey him from faith? The opportunity belongs to you. He is the answer to all things. He is the solution to every problem, even yours, even all of yours, if you will have faith in him and give your life to his promises as we stand and sing.